Uh, so uh, Morgan has asked uh, if we start this by <laughs> me talking about myself, which I'm highly uncomfortable doing. Um, but is, is that what is that how we want to start, Tom? That that sounds great. I think yeah, maybe introduce yourself to those um, who who aren't familiar with your work, Jeffrey. Great. All right. Well, I'll give you a, a very quick uh, rundown of of me. Um, I think uh, going all the way back, uh, I've always been a, a maker um, and sort of got funneled in towards uh, a product design degree, uh, which I thought was making things. Uh, and sort of about three quarters of the way through it, uh, I realized it was about mass production and uh, generally about plastic. Uh, and I didn't really, really like that. And so it was quite uh, disenfranchised, disenfranchised, I guess. Um, and so I became a graphic designer for many years and I sat in, a, in front of a computer. And at some point I realized I was deeply unhappy and that was the big changing moment in my world. Uh, I went off to Canada and uh, and I well, actually I found I was trying to present, create a little slideshow to show you maybe some of my training. But uh, all I could find was this one photo of the very first straw bale building that I ever uh, saw. And I don't know if you can see that, but it's I mean, it's got this massive bulbous bit here. It's I don't. To me, uh, now looking at it, I'm, I think it's horrid. Uh, <laughs> but at the time, as someone who'd never built a house, uh, I thought it was the most wonderful thing that anyone could get involved in. This person had just built it themselves. And so that building was, was very much my introduction and my sort of catalyst into natural building. Uh, I spent a little while traveling around the States um, and ended up after being in uh, in Aprovecho in Oregon uh, for a couple of years, I went to uh, a place in Utah, uh, a town called Moab, and they had a program there uh, called Community Rebuilds, which was all about replacing old dilapidated uh, trailers, trailer homes, uh, with new straw bale uh, houses. And they'd worked out that they could uh, run a training program for for new natural builders uh the builders got to come there for free or the the students got to come there for free uh the homeowners got a, a cheaper building uh and they got you know everyone was winning it seemed um so beyond that uh i then well, i ended up in uh, in north america for five years and somehow uh, and uh decided i wanted to come back uh, and at that point, I found the Prince's Foundation. Now, if you've listened to the podcast, that was a uh, definite common theme. Everyone has either done or wants to do the Prince's Foundation uh, program. Um, so I did that uh, as a way of introducing myself to as many people in the industry as I could. Um, and from there, I went on to work in natural building in the UK. Um, and kind of my big thing, I set up a company called Heartwin. Um, and my focus within that company was to develop training programs uh, and bring on um, people that have maybe never built anything uh, right the way up to sort of quite experienced uh, builders and sort of develop them into uh, people that were would be uh, paid, paid builders, I guess. Um, so yeah, we built three houses with with Heartwin. Um, of the the last build was a, a sixteen week build where we had ten students, uh, and of those ten students, five of them are now employed in uh, building. Um, so more in the sort of sustainable eco building stuff, less natural materials. But I was pretty happy with that. Um, so yeah. Finally, uh, so the podcast, uh, should chat about that. Uh, it was, I realized that I was building and I'd stopped learning and it felt weird to me. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, so the, the podcast primarily came about just as a way to, to have an excuse to go and ask people questions. And, you know, I've chatted to Becky and really got to know what she's up to. 
um through the podcast and yeah it kind of gives me an excuse to to ask all these questions um so yeah it's been going for a couple of years now uh and it was really great to do this episode particularly because it feels like coming full circle and uh yeah it feels um what is it it's that i mean i don't feel like i'm all those many years away from being a sort of trainee myself um and certainly all these conversations brought up lots of the, the feelings that i had when i was in training um so yeah to bring it back to, to sort of that thing which has been at the core of my uh, my world is uh, it's really great there you go i think that's so, me yeah i've got i've got a whole bunch of questions that have been coming in about this um but but before I go to anybody else's questions, I thought I would ask I have my own one. Um, so, um, I guess you know, in listening to the podcast and uh, and you know, and and seeing other people through uh, Ibuki that have uh, been doing training in earth building, there's um, I guess there's a commonality in that you have to really want to do it to train yourself up as an earth builder because the opportunities aren't there and it's, you know, it's bloody difficult. Um, and, and what you need then is that self-motivation and the drive and the desire to become this different person, living this different life, it seems to me. And, and in a way that creates people with, with real buy-in to what we're trying to do that can then go on and, and spread that uh, to other people. And it, so you develop this network, which is what we have almost on a medieval level of, of sort of craft, people mentoring other people and learning from other people and, and journeying around to gain that experience, sometimes in Britain and sometimes in other countries. Um, and yet in Ibuki, what we've been trying to do is go from that to a more uh, systematic and a national level of training where people can gain accreditation and skills through certified courses that are organized and recognized and funded and to be honest that's been a real struggle because uh you know training in the uk for in the construction industry is just in a mess just now you speak to anybody across you know the citb and other organizations and they just say is you know we've tried to make all these changes and they haven't worked and uh the funding isn't there anymore and and it's just a mess so I'm just wondering if, you know, if we got to that place where you had all these courses, do you think that would uh, open up lots more opportunities and and um, make it much easier for people? Or do you think that struggle is part of what is part of the strength in a way of, of where we are just now? What do you think, Jeremy? Uh, hmm. It's an interesting one. Um I, uh, with the training, I feel like uh, having a little bit of paper that says, you know, I've got this is, I've never found it to be that relevant in my world. Um, and to me, the relevance is really in working with people uh, and developing like good practices and a portfolio and that those are the things that you can sort of show to people and, and sort of open open the doors. Um, and I think the training that you're talking about is is good in that it is, you know, it's, it's actual sort of hands on training. Uh, where am I going with this? Um, uh, yeah, I feel it's very difficult. Um, but you, you know, you can you go to Germany and you see there that there are a lot more uh, natural builders and there is actually an industry and there's a lot more manufacturing going on. But there they've got a much more uh, localized, pluralistic construction industry and their craft system of of trades is still strong. You know, in in helping to organise that, so the, the the supporting framework is there, and you've got an informed public that that demands better and more environmentally sustainable buildings than the public does in Britain. And you look at France, where the government puts a lot of funding into training because they think it's important. 
and neither of those things are really true in Britain. And to some extent, mm. if we want a thriving eco-building sector and lots of people training up in it, um, you need the demand to be there, don't you? You need you can train people, but but you also need, you know, if you have if you've got jobs for people, then then the the, the training opportunities will come. I think there's a yes. lot of people that you, you can train, but but are the jobs necessarily there? Kit, were you on? Can I come in on this? Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, so uh, I I absolutely agree with you, Tom. That like I think we shouldn't just be aiming to create, create training opportunities. What we really need to be doing is growing the sector and creating working opportunities. And the training comes as part of that um, to fill the roles that are needed. I think we have a situation at the moment where there are a lot of like sort of entry le level training opportunities. Um, and there's a lot of demand for that. There's a lot of people who want to get involved and want to be uh, part of this world um and i think that what we what we need to sort of get people from that position to being a sort of thriving sector is um it is not to create lots of training opportunities but to create a few really good training opportunities that that will take um yeah which we, we, which allows us to sort of grow the sector, grow the industry in a way that is sustainable, um, that uh, that people can like build a life on it, essentially. Mm. I think one of the issues, sorry, thank you, Kit, that was nice. Uh, I think one of the issues is the sort of sporadic nature of the building. You know, I have a, uh, I'll have a few projects, you know, here and there, and I'll need people, um, but, it's not a consistent stream of work um and that consistency you know if that consistency was more than i think we'd i'd have more demand for for new uh you know it's sort of the upcoming talent in natural building to, to come and work with me um so yes definitely creating more of an industry would would certainly help so, okay, I, so I've got a bunch of questions now I should start uh, dipping into. First one, um, which uh, is, is it more realistic to train uh, masons, mortar masons and plasterers um, from, who have existing skills from conventional constructions to, to uh, develop earth building skills because the, the practical side of the skills is quite transferable to other uh, ecological materials and they're already there, uh, have the experience within the industry, and you can kind of draw them over from the dark side to the light side. Um, and and um, that reflects the reality of how the construction industry is, rather than perhaps what was reflected in some of the, the experience in the podcast, which was people sort of transferring from other routes in life across to eco-building because of you know commitment to the environment or, or other sort of personal issues do you think well, that, both are relevant or sort of kit so my experience was that i uh sort of from working at cat and being interested in kind of eco building um i kind of looked at the sector and i was like you know i love this but everyone who's doing straw building except for perhaps like one or two percent of them are doing this as volunteers and so that or and everyone who's you know most of the, perhaps in earth building it's not quite as extreme as that but it it definitely seems to be a theme across the the sector that a lot of the work was being done by people who weren't getting paid so i looked at it and was like well i can't i can't get a job in that <laughs> um and so i that was why i decided to sort of train to become a carpenter and a timber framer essentially and then to work in other materials um as and when i could uh, and and kind of um incorporating that into my work so i think like from my own personal perspective that was that was the way um that was the way of making that work but i thought it was really interesting what jamie said in the podcast as well that uh when he was training to be a plasterer in a sort of 
mainstream college kind of situation that they were actually training with with clay <laughs> um uh but not thinking about that as being an option for like using in their work it was yeah that was that was i didn't i hadn't heard of that before and that that mm. was really interesting to me yeah i thought i thought uh kit your route into the uh into what you're doing is was really interesting it was kind of unique in that you were someone that didn't say you were going to volunteer you know you you stood against that um and you know the others so anna had to you know she lived on a voluntary basis working on, on other people's properties uh just to afford to do the studying she needed to do to uh to sort of get into this industry so people are have been had to be really inventive um and and yeah and i think what you're saying as well about the the sort of industry certainly i've seen it in the straw bale industry um especially is i think that that whole market has been markets maybe not the right word but it's been sold as this affordable thing you know it mud is everywhere it's cheap you know and it's completely undervalued um you know through having volunteers build everything and the sort of running of training courses it's completely undervalued the the regular worker and i know that's something that mickey is sort of feeling right now i could really feel her uh, her pain in the in our conversation it's you know it's a real struggle but yeah i, I mean if because there's that, I just wonder why people are so keen to give voluntary labour then in this sector. Because you say it can undermine people that are actually have trained and want to do it as a job if you're trying to compete with people that don't want to be paid. Because a trainee joiner that's 17 and going to college or a plumber or something, they get paid at a pittance, but they're supported by state funding and, and they get trained you know, on the job and you can see that route in. This the, the the sort of eco construction hasn't quite got to that model, and I I wonder, on the one hand, there's opportunities there, but but does it cause a problem in terms of sustaining it in the long term? Mickey, did you want to? Oh, we lost her again. Well, well no, we're I'm here. I'm just turning oh, the camera okay. off because of my back is not Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. What was the question again? <laughs> Sorry. It, it was really this thing about people learning by giving voluntary labour. Is that a, a double edged sword, as it were? Do we do ourselves damage to the sector by yeah, not for me, uh, sustainable employment? Over the last three years, I think it's done a lot of damage in terms of my progression and confidence into trying to get paid in the like straw bale or earth building sector because I feel like I'm never good enough to be paid because there's always volunteers willing to do the job in some fashion whereas you know I've put a lot of money into training and to get trained to be professional so I think it, it is doing damage to those people that training to be professional and do it as a career that that really, really struck me about your um, podcast, Nikki. Uh, and it, yeah, it, re it really resonated with me as well. And even though I, I have tried to sort of avoid doing uh, too much volunteering myself, I, I have done, you know, bits and pieces. And I've certainly done work where I've not been paid very much uh, at all. And I've, and I've just done it to sort of get experience. Um, and but I also sort of recognised I came at it from quite a like privileged position, having been working at Cat and ha and 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 knowing quite a lot of people in this world already. Um, and so being able to sort of get into it that way. But I also wondered whether something that struck me about the about the interviews and also about like just my own kind of anecdotal experience of people that I know was whether there's like a a sort of um gendered element to this as well that it it seems like um the the two women that you interviewed had had done a, a lot more 
sort of uh, uh, unpaid work, a lot, a, a lot more uh, volunteering work to sort of get into it um, than uh, myself and, and Jamie. And uh, yeah, it seems to be something that 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 I feel like happens more generally. And so I wonder if there's something about our industry that is also telling women in particular that you have to do unpaid labor um and and i think it, it yeah i, I think I, that's I interesting think... question because we 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 also as it just had some like like fantastic kind of like female like women leaders um who are doing like fantastic work at the top i wonder if it's like yeah if if there's particular barriers there um at, at the training I, level, what do you I, think? I think hmm. I, I don't think it's just in this industry. I think it's a common thread through how women are respected generally, or you know, they have to do a lot of unpaid labour in every walk of life. I think so. It's about confidence building and being on a par with their male counterparts, but feeling they're not good enough all the time. Yeah. I think the, the gender in issue is really interesting and sometimes there's a reluctant, reluctance to discuss it, but when when you look at the eco-building sector, whether it's straw bale or earth building, generally you find roughly about 50-50, you find a, a healthy gender balance there in the people that are involved. But when you look at conventional construction, say in the UK, there's only about 6% women involved in construction. It's one of the least um, uh, equal uh, industries in terms of gender representation and I think thinking about that uh, it, it's it's not so much um, that uh, eco building is doing something special it's actually we are the normal because we are representing society it's, it's a marker of how uh, unbalanced conventional construction and and the the culture and the economy of the conventional construction industry um, uh, repels the uh, the activity of women in that sector. So you can see it as a kind of symptom of the malaise of conventional construction, which then goes across to the, the environmental impact in terms of resource depletion, uh, toxicity, and, and waste production from conventional construction. And those things are all interrelated. You know, the health of a construction sector is a holistic thing and, and gender is one of the ways you can measure that. Um, okay, I, I've got all these other questions. I've, I've only done one. <laughs> <so> we'll, <laughs> okay. We're going to be here all morning and Louis is going to kick in, us Sorry, off. just in, to bring it right the way back to your actual original question, um, yes. which was should we be training masons and not you know, mm -hmm. uh, sort of earth specific? I think one of the big things that comes across in the training is that you're absorbing so much more than just how to use a trowel to put something on a wall you know there's a an ideology there's um you know you're getting that whole sustainability education uh as opposed to you know someone that might be very good at putting gypsum or cement on a wall uh and could make that switch across but you know maybe hasn't been sort of trained in that that sort of more holistic viewpoint yeah, and, and I think, you know, conventional builders, you know, for that simplistic term, they, when, when, you, when you train them in natural materials, they do appreciate, you know, the health benefits of not using toxic materials and things that destroy their hands. Uh, so it's, it, it does work. Okay, second question. Do we need more earth jobs and a bigger market to sustain full-time training in earth skills? And so I guess this is a thing, again, where, you know, conventional construction there is a massive market there are lots of commercial companies selling products that will support training and there's you can get a large number of people through certified training courses is it just an issue of scale if there was a bigger demand or if, you know say the regulations or carbon taxation made eco building more economic generally um is is that actually the route to creating more jobs and better training uh, I feel that's a little bit chicken and egg because if suddenly everyone started, you know, big construction companies were saying, right, we need one earth plaster everything. Mm. And then there wouldn't be enough earth plasters and they go, well, well, we can't do that failure. And, you know, then it 
you know, as it is, eco is always the thing that gets sort of bumped off the 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 build uh, as as the budget gets tighter. And you know, I've had so many earth floor jobs which have never come to fruition because they've run out of money by the time they're putting up an earth floor the finished floor down. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a difficult one to just say. Uh, you know, can we make it bigger and that will, that will fix everything? Um, mm. I think it would help to sort of grow it, certainly. I think in, in Germany, that part of the revival of, of earth materials was led by the clay plastering industry, which was a lot to do with retrofit of existing, you know, sick buildings by internal finishes. And that actually produced a scale of demand uh, that wasn't really to do with new buildings and then it uh, you know, transferred across to the new buildings. And and that thing of of eco refurbishment of you know improving the thermal comfort of old buildings of which you know we've got a lot in the UK and and control of moisture is perhaps a route where you could get that scale of demand, but it would be in that sort of plastering thing. Um, I guess so. There was another question: Do we think that the the revival of lime as a material is a model that we could follow in terms of growing a sector and delivering training? um I mean, how how does that how does that look what what's that sort of been the the steps in the lime revival that kit do you know about that um i i suppose the 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 interesting thing to me about lime is that everyone you speak to about lime seems to have a different opinion on it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so um, the, uh, I, yeah, I, it certainly, it certainly came across in, in the podcast that like people who have done um, kind of gone down more the plastering route have often found themselves kind of tending more towards the lime um side of it the w one element of that as well i think is the um this question about like the extent to which things that are, that that start out as a sort of um a natural material that where you want to sort of like find a local supply uh, of it um become kind of turned into a product uh, and become something that you can kind of buy off the shelf and use in a very sort of standardized way. And I guess in with Lime, that's been things like the uh, NHLs and um, the uh, and sort of Lime putty and things. And it's, uh, there's, there's perhaps now more of a sort of second wave in the in the lime revival that's more interested in um like hot limes and things that might be a, a bit less sort of standard and a bit more kind of requiring um uh yeah kind of um a bit more of a kind of in-depth look at things so um I think it is an interesting model, but there's also some potential pitfalls to learn from there mm. as well. But I'd, I, I, I'm not much of a plasterer myself, so I'm more of a plasterer. Yeah, yeah. what, what would Mickey say about that? I wonder. I, I think that clients I've worked with are reluctant to use clay because they don't know the properties of it. Whereas, and if they're doing lime, then they kind of done a maybe a one day, two day course with a company, and the company can give them advice. But with clay, they're they're a bit more unsure about how it's going to work and where they're going to get it from, and the process if it's from their land takes a long time. So they're not really that keen to use it. Because mm. mm. I think there was a time. So I, I think know... there needs to be a lot more work. You know, maybe thirty years. A lot years... more work done in the kind of. Yeah. As you can say, there was a time thirty years ago when kind of lime was a bit on its knees, and and people were reluctant to use it because they didn't uh, trust it, and the tradition was dying out, and and that revival really came through the heritage uh, industry of this being appropriate materials and so on. Mm -hmm. Where there's you know there's a body of demand for work, there's a, a network of. Um, 
uh, skills training and and companies that you know often on craft basis that are that are delivering that and the material science and the products kind of developed along with that demand and 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 practice has improved over the last 30 years but then that's led on to use in eco buildings as well we've got uh, you know um uh lime crete and and the use of lime finishes on new buildings as well um but it was growing out of that base in in conservation and i think earth traditional earth materials have had poor recognition in the conservation community but that is improving as well you know english heritage have been doing work so has historic scotland and you know a lot of particularly on the earth mortars and, and plasters there are a lot of buildings out there that do need appropriate repairs what roland was saying yesterday about a thousand core buildings being sold every year if those buildings were being appropriately repaired and maintained and extended with similar materials, you would be able to support people, you know, being um, mud masons and and uh, earth plasterers because there would be the demand there. So that thing of recognition and and trust in the material is a kind of cultural thing that goes along with people in primary school thinking, I want to be, a, you know, a mud mason when I grow up. Mm. Okay, so uh, we're drifting off. So uh, next question, where do you think you're going to be in five years' time? Uh, so Kit first, then Mickey, and then we'll come to Jeffrey. <laughs> People are always asking me this, and <laughs> how, how do I know? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, I so. Yeah, I'm currently um, working for a, a timber framing company uh, called Hector and Cedric in in um, in Sheffield here. Um, and for the last few years, I've been um, kind of uh, well doing the Prince's Foundation uh, program and working kind of independently as as a builder and timber framer. Um, and I guess uh yeah it's it's quite nice to sort of join a company and and be be part of that and have a bit more um stability for a little while um but over the next five years uh i don't know i i i i, I tend to kind of um uh just um take one step at a time and see what builds uh, on what. But uh, I guess I want to be um, running a company that uh, interesting building projects using a whole range of uh, kind of innovative materials. And and yeah. also I do, the other thing I really enjoy doing is is training myself actually. So I do, uh, I do some teaching at CAT at the Centre for Alternative Technology with the um, uh, so shout out to everyone who's who's uh, who's there studying there um, and uh, so I really love that and I really love uh, the sort of training that is all about kind of play and experimenting and uh, seeing uh, how far you can push materials and uh, um, all of that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, the more of that that I can work into into what I do, the better as well. I, th I think it's really interesting that, that you uh, you know want to be running your own company in five years, and and often in the training that that is offered, it's a very technical uh, kind of training. And when uh, in the pirate project we developed the ECVET units, we made sure that there was an economy in unit in there because People that have been working in the sector for a number of years, when they get together, they always talk about how do you make a job pay and the efficiency. And it's actually how can I sustain myself in business and make a profit at this? It's not so much about, you know, the trial skills and so on. So I think yeah. there is a thing where if we're training people up to have viable careers in, in, in natural building, then we do have to, you know, engage with the money side as well and and see where it is appropriate to use volunteers and, and just how you can get that balance right. Mickey. Well, that, mm, cut, cut, cut. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that is like definitely part of also what attracted me to going like to getting into being a builder was that 
you also you, you that that is not just about the sort of hand skills and things, but it is also about like um, as a self-employed person, you are able on the one hand to have kind of quite a lot of autonomy and being able to like work with different people and uh, and like create your own kind of set of social relationships like that. Um, but on the other hand, like that way in which the industry works at the moment doesn't give people a lot of stability. Um, and so when I'm thinking about like the kind of organization that I want to create and be involved in, it's it, it's also looking at like the model and how that, uh, you know how that employs people i think part of the reason why we don't have a lot of the sort of high quality apprenticeships that we were talking about in the um uh in the podcast is that actually those of us who are now like working in this industry uh still feel kind of semi precarious as well uh in the sense that uh, yeah we we'll kind of work job to job and 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 um uh, have a lot of um, uncertainty about the future and so we don't feel security for ourselves so we don't we also don't feel security for being able to take someone on as a as a trainee um, and so I think yeah part of what interests me in this world and in this like in this career is also like how do we develop um, different kinds of models that are um yeah that that get us away from that hmm. mickey where 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 do you want to be in five years okay. well at the moment i am on the princess foundation building craft program so that finishes in april and in five years i'd really like to be much more proficient um uh, in and um, skill and knowledge in earth clustering and I also really want to take it into the retrofitting more like you were saying about Germany. It, I live in a council flat and would like to do lime and clay clustering and that to kind of show it can be done and like what health benefits there are even in kind of city style. And I also, I'm an artist and I would like to really bring the two together and do some more uh, uh, like earth, lime, neural type installations and bring those two things into teaching about sustainable materials for community groups and like children also the architects i think could be do with much more training in sustainability and especially uh, <laughs> uh yeah because i studied in hasselt last year in belgium and most of them were architects and i think that a lot of that information is really getting into the design process and the two things aren't up very well so i'd really like to go into a bit more teaching but i feel like i haven't got enough skill yet and knowledge to do that so that's what i'm working towards i'm also getting older so i'm trying to think how i can you know move the two things together and keep in the industry great jeffrey where will you be in five years? Oh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> do you know what? I'd like to be. Um, I'd like to be assessing people for uh, the NVQ in Earth Building. How's that? That's brilliant. <laughs> and I was, yeah, and obviously continuing to um, to build and to to train. And if you were if you were assessing people, where are these people going to be? Are they going to be learning on site through a, a you know an apprenticeship mentoring experience? Are they going to be in colleges? Um, how how do you how do you see that being? Uh, for me, I mean, the real value is uh, on on sites working with someone you know who who can take them under their wing and do that that stuff. Uh, you know that sort of business nurturing as well like you know i feel i really feel really bad for for mickey that she didn't have anyone to tell her that it was a terrible idea to get into that horrible situation in ireland she was talking about uh sort of training training volunteers while you know not 
doing the work she was being paid to and, and taking on too much. Uh, you know, so having people there to guide them in not just travel skills, but also business skills, you know, and see the see the bigger picture. Um, so, yeah, very much. I think there is a place for for sort of college courses, but I think the real learning and the real uh I was going to say cementing of knowledge. But that's probably a damn term. Uh, <laughs> is um, you know, it comes from that repetition and the you know the the few little uh, inputs that your your sort of uh, mentor can can give, which you know, those little bits which bring you on a lot when you just have time to you know continually lay on walls and. Mm. And if there was a if there was a seventeen year old that you bumped into the street that was leaving school with a sort of handful of of old grades, and they say, "Jeffrey, I want to be like you. I want to be a natural builder." What would you say to them about what that path is like, and would it be different from your path now, or or is it the same struggle? Do you know what I get asked a lot? I probably get an email a week uh, from people saying that they want to be a natural builder, or you know, they want to come and work with me. Um, and my general response is to look to heritage and i think the the training opportunities and and like kit did you know the sort of look for heritage and look for a job where you can get in as a as a laborer and and sort of learn that way i think it's a more sustainable way into the industry yeah. um at the moment it's, yeah it's it's interesting because just thinking back to what i said about the start of comparing us to france and to to germany actually one of the things when you compare with those countries is our heritage sector is one of our strengths and that it is fairly well organized and, and well established so that route through that line took and and we've been trying to uh develop with earth is you know you're perhaps right there that there is a there is a route through uh that that you know the wall between historic building and natural building it's paper thin really it's it's two rooms in the same house in many respects and and a lot of the same skills and issues uh, transfer across right let's find another question um i'm assuming somebody from backstage will just stop us when we've come <laughs> to the end of our period and until then i will just keep posing uh questions let me see Ah, Jeffrey, what surprised you in the course of these conversations, the, the four conversations that you had in your podcast? Um, what surprised me? Um, I think I mean, what initially surprised me was how hard it was to find someone who'd gone into that, gone in sort of a fire and more traditional route. Uh, I expected, I and mean, I emailed probably like close to every uh, earth builder in Devon uh, and said, yeah, have you got a trainee, someone that's coming up in the sort of traditional manner? Uh, I'd really love to speak to them. And there wasn't any, um, or no one could, could sort of point me at one. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was a surprise to me that I couldn't find people sort of really far outside of the sort of the bubble, I guess, that we're in. Um, yeah, you know, and and sort of from that, like, I was surprised that there was this sort of funnel. Everyone seemed to funnel into the Prince's Foundation, and then the Prince's Foundation was that stepping stone into into like where they wanted to be. Mm. Um, even Jamie, who is he's working, you know, he's uh, working as a an earth blaster. Um, he still aspires to do the Prince's Foundation to you know, take himself that further further on. So I think that was a surprise that this that the Princess Foundation was such a uh uh well, sort of vector, I guess. Uh and maybe that's just because of not managing to get out of my uh out of my sort of sphere of, of uh people I know. Um but then the other thing I guess that's uh surprised me was just the the struggle and the ingenuity of people's you know, ways to support themselves through through the training like i think mickey and jamie said you've got to buy a van and live in it you know and it was just that was just uh, like an accepted thing uh so yeah those were the surprises mm -hmm.
It's interesting because I didn't know a lot about the Princess Foundation, but but you're right. It seems to be a, a conduit uh, that people gravitate towards. Kid, do you know? Does that then work a bit like the sort of the SPAB um, trainees, the people that go through that that process of getting uh, a grounding in heritage and making the contacts in a network that then can sustain a career? And it's a recognised, you know, if we don't have. Uh, VQs yet in Earth building actually deliverable in the UK is it's something that's recognised in the sector. Yeah, um, it, it's certainly like a, an excellent network, and that you um, you come across people um, and people have heard of it. Often people confuse it with the Prince's Trust as well. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, yeah, um, I was just looking at some of the um, the comments. Uh, for this uh, event and um, Peter Hickson says mm. that he's put uh, three carpenters, uh, three apprentices, he's had three apprentice carpenters who are now builders themselves. So I wonder if Peter would be a good person to talk to next time about uh, finding people who've, who've trained perhaps like through uh, the kind of apprentice and, and college route. Um, and uh yeah there's a, a few other people have said as as well about uh, that being um a uh like looking at one of the more kind of conventional um skills that are kind of recognized and have a college route to 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 do that to sort of get into the industry and then be able to um take on uh um some more specialist things kind of once you're yeah. established as a as a builder um yeah there's some really great comments going on in the chat so. yeah i i so okay so to ask to sort of a devil's advocate a different different approach then is the question about do you think that actually we need a completely different approach to this in that what you see in the eco building is that it's part of a kind of a global fight for survival of the species and for us stopping, you know, destroying the planet. And it is as much about human relationships as it is about building more stuff and that maybe we need to change the model and that that's reflected in some of the people that are uh, trying to be eco builders and their passion uh, that they invest in it. And, and their vision of change that they want to deliver. And so that just following a traditional process perhaps isn't going to deliver that. And that some of the stuff of the holistic model that's coming through the jump training about teaching a different way of being and relating to each other on a construction site and maybe relating to uh, clients and, and seeing training building occupants as part of the mission of an eco builder as well. Do you think we just need to broaden our mission and become more mm -hmm. ambitious rather than just trying to survive in a world that wasn't really built for equal builders. Yeah, we do. And we need to be careful not to lionize the mainstream construction <laughs> industry as well, because it's crap. <laughs> uh, um, and um, yeah, and also not lionize the sort of um, the apprenticeship model, because I think there's also a lot of exploitation that goes on uh, with apprentices. It's a, 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 often they're very hit and miss, like the quality of apprenticeships. Um, you know, there's lots of lots of people doing apprenticeships with sort of big mainstream builders that have it. You know, some of the people that I was in college with having a terrible time of it. And so um, uh, and and often, yeah, the chat would be about like, how quickly you could like knock up a like hanging a door uh on a piece rate and things like that it was like um there's there's lots and lots and lots of things that we need to be doing differently um and uh yeah and and in terms of the like human relationships uh how we create building sites that are like um about people um yeah being fulfilled in a in a sort of a holistic way like absolutely um 
yeah, I mentioned on the podcast like some of Emma Appleton's work uh, around this, which I think is really uh, excellent. Um, and um, yeah, uh, but you know, part of that is is paying people properly and is paying people properly like whilst they're training as well, because people have value to bring right from the first day that they're on site and and like trainees need to recognize that and employers need to recognize that as well i think yeah i mean you can see training eco builders as part of our you know yeah. route to survival as a species mm. nikki mickey what do you think about this uh, i think there needs to be a fundamental shift in all sectors because the design process as well as the people commissioning building needs to be more holistic because we can't we can't just have the earth builders or eco builders being this nice holistic community if you want but you know the design of these buildings needs to come from that as well and thinking behind that from an architectural point of view i think there's sometimes a big mismatch between all of these different players in making a building work uh, and the community around them and the whole like who has what invested and I think that is not really talked about and it's very much there's the builders and there's the clients, there's the architects or whoever's putting money into it. So I think a really fundamental change needs to take place. Great. Jeffrey, what's what what what's your take? You've got quite a round experience mm -hmm. on all this. You've been around the course a few times. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I think that's a compliment, right? It is, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think I see issues in that very eco building training model. I see issues in the standard uh, conventional uh, training model. Uh, yeah, maybe we can we can cherry pick the best. And these these conversations, I think, are really good at, at highlighting. Um, I've, you know, I've already had quite a lot of feedback from people that have listened to the, the podcast who have said that, you know, they didn't realize, or, you know, even in sort of the conversations they'd had with people that who had been through training, you know, they hadn't realized like quite the issues that people were, you know, trainees were up against. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's, I think, you know, we can find our own line somewhere in the middle of, uh, of all of that. Yeah, and I, I see somebody in the chat talking about doing doing a school, and you know this. Uh, when we do energy saving projects, often the way to the adults is through the children, and I think you know the more we can we can uh, you know influence the the culture and the values of the next generation, the better place will be. But we can't really wait that long, can we? We need to make the change now. Okay, so we've got I think just a few minutes to to wrap things up now, and I'll I'll just go around and, and any last thoughts or things you want to throw out there or questions that, that I haven't managed to ask you that you really wanted to, to answer. Kiss, I'll, I'll come to you first. Uh, well, I just want to say thanks to Jeffrey for like pulling this together because um, it was, yeah, it was really great to be part of it. It's something that I've been thinking about for, for quite a long time. Uh, myself is a, is sort of like the structure of our industry and how volunteering and training and things like that fit into it. Um, and I, well, I'd like this to be a turning point where we, uh, as an industry, decide we move away from pay to volunteer model. We move away from the sort of uh, the model that says you've got to volunteer for years before you're allowed to <laughs> be paid to do anything. Um, and uh, yeah, and it is also like where we decide to establish something like what you talk about, Jeffrey, in the sort of summation of the podcast, which is, a, you know, a proper program that we can uh, pull together our kind of collective experience to, um, to create for some for some people coming into the industry and make that really high quality make it uh uh feel like it nurtures someone uh or a few people um and uh yeah let's let's make this a turning point 
Mm, great. Mickey? Yeah, I, th I just want to thank Jeffrey for being in touch with me and to be part of this because it's been a really valuable conversation because sometimes you just feel like these things go around in your head and you feel very isolated. And I think that's partly like being on the Princess Foundation training has opened up some networks. And I, a lot of people I've met in the sustainable building world are actually quite introverts. So it's quite difficult to get those networks and keep a hold of them and keep going. So I think that's, for me, that's been really valuable to actually talk about these issues and bring them to light. And the other thing I'd like to say is that although I can see lots of problems with things all the time, I, I really love earth plus train and just getting dirty and playing with materials just to bring that back to this is why I do it. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice one, Mickey. Yeah. I think I think we all do what we do because we love it, not because it's easy um, or, or profitable. Yeah. Jeff. <laughs> Jeffrey, I think, you know, uh, we all thank you for sort of bringing this conversation together. It's been a really useful uh, experience for everyone. Final thoughts, questions? We haven't asked you questions you wanted to ask the others. Uh, well, I think the, the thing for me that came out of the conversations was that the big opportunities came from networks and... Yeah, it was the contacts you made that were really important. Uh, and I, it, Mickey talked about, you know, pushing herself out of her comfort zone to get in contact with people and, you know, and sort of make some of those uh, connections, like you know, going off to Italy to a, a conference and then finding someone that would, that she could, you know, go and, and work with. Uh, and Anna talked about, you know, meeting the Steens on, uh, on a Clayfest course and then, going over to America and, and working with them. I mean, what a fantastic opportunity. I'm like massively jealous of. Um, <laughs> but um, so, yeah, I guess uh, that maybe tips for, for developing that network and, and sort of encouraging anyone that might be listening to how to sort of create it more. Um, I'd be interested to know what Mickey and, and uh, Kit's thoughts about that are. Any thoughts, Kit, Kit, Mickey, taking this forward? Um, do you want to go first, Mickey? Um, well, I, I don't know. I'd like to keep in contact with everybody and like maybe keep some kind of like network. I don't know how that works because I'm not very good on tech stuff. So, uh, yeah. I think somebody organizing these things is always a challenge. Yeah. But I would think it would be interesting to have like a specific network maybe for trainees as well. So we can talk about these things because we're all over the country and a lot of time that is one of the problems you just feel really kind of on your own and like where do you go from here? I, I think, um, mm, sorry, Kate, were you going um, Yeah, well, it, 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 I mean, it strikes me it is, Ibuki's um, role to sort of take the lead on this. Um, so maybe we could establish some sort of group to take it forward. Um, uh, and also just, again, wanted to just highlight some really great stuff going on in the chat uh, alongside people talking. There's someone talked about uh, their college in South Wales that, um, Grant has talked about a college in South Wales that's really interested in taking forward some sort of natural building provision. Uh, other people talking about wanting to be involved in that. So it feels like it feels like there's energy there to to bring something together. It's quite exciting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think e Bucky's role really is as a networking organisation, and what's coming out of this discussion is. You know, a strong network will help everybody achieve their aspirations. And, um, you, you know, we are, we do speak to uh, Historic Scotland and the Historic England and the CITB and the qualifications authorities and, and that side of things. 
um, but also a lot of our members who are earth builders deliver training, you know, to a greater or lesser extent. And, and we have relationships with training centres. One of our trustees is the director of the Scottish Lyme Centre. And, and so I think we're, we're in a position to, to offer a, a, a space for that conversation to continue, but also to relate earth skills with the other natural building skills. We've got a relationship with SBOX, Straw Bale, uh, UK, and we've talked about doing a joint event with the Building Limes Forum. Uh, and then there's the overarching thing of, of Nature Build um, UK as well. So I think um, I think this conversation will continue. And, you know, it'd be great if, if all three of you can help participate, you know, through Bucky in, in developing that network and, and uh, taking it forward for everyone. Uh, so I think we'll draw it to a conclusion there, and, and thank you very much, uh, Kit and Mickey and Jeffrey. Of course, that's been absolutely uh, fantastic discussion.